Hello and welcome to what may well be the most innovative and best business event on the Irish calendar for 2021. My name is Matt Cooper. I'll be here for the next two and a half hours or so with you. This is the 13th year of The Big Ideas, a highly successful event from Enterprise Ireland that has assisted in the growth of so many successful and ambitious Irish companies. Last year, for the first time, we did this event in the absence of a live audience because of you know what. Indeed, all of our contestants last year also joined us virtually. This year, though, we have a slight difference. We still don't have a live crowd in the room, unfortunately, but all of the presentations will be made live here at the RDS in Dublin. And that will give me the chance to eyeball everyone directly as I put questions after the three minute presentations that each of them make. Three minutes. We're going to be as ruthlessly strict as ever when it comes to that, to be fair to everyone. And two minutes for questions and answers afterwards. So that's all to come, as is a meeting with a highly successful entrepreneur who has a great story to share with us, a very different one. Imer Noon may not be who some would call an entrepreneur, given that she's a famous composer and concert conductor, but I think she is one, and we'll discover why later. The first person, though, who I want to talk to is Deirdre Glenn from Enterprise Ireland, where she is the Director of Life Sciences. Deirdre, tell us a little bit of what you're hoping to achieve on today's event. Well, I suppose, Matt, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, this is a fantastic occasion for us in Enterprise Ireland to sh showcase the most innovative, high potential startups emerging from our research and clinical community and the, to give them to, the opportunity to show the global world some of the most innovative um, solutions to, to problems that we're trying to solve around the world. I suppose it's also a great opportunity for investors, both here in Ireland and internationally, to see the commercial potential of these startups. And you know that's what we're here for. I'll, uh, these startups are looking for funding. Yeah, because that's a very important point, is that these, what I've seen, are great ideas, which will be very, very useful to society when they get implemented. But the important point from you as well is that they're investor ready, aren't they at present? Correct, yeah, no, absolutely. So what you're going to see today is all of these candidates are seeking that first round of investment. You know, they're, they're here and they're they're trying to show their value proposition, but they are seeking investors um, around the world. And, and it's certainly, the last 18 months has been quite challenging on the funding scene. It, yes, again, it's been challenging in so many ways for so many people, but for these type of companies, how difficult has it been for them to get money, but also perhaps to do the development work that they would have wanted? Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, I suppose, first of all, there's nothing like face-to-face, -face, and the last 18 months has prevented that face-to-face. -face. So. If you're trying to convince somebody to invest in you, you want that rapport, you want that engagement. So where they may have had those relationships, you know, they were able to build on them. But if you're out seeking your first round of investment, yes, you can do it virtually, but you know, it's much better if you have the opportunity to do it in person. So from a funding perspe perspective, excuse me, it has been challenging. And in terms of their technology development, of course, access for, particularly on the healthcare side, a lot of our companies want access to clinicians and access to hospitals. And again, as you know, that's been hugely, hugely challenging over the last 18 months. And I suppose we are doing a virtual event here today, but again, anyone who is interested in investing in any of these companies can make their appointments and can get to do the face-to-face -face meetings after what they see today. Yeah, absolutely. And thankfully, the world is starting to open back up. And with that, you know, we're putting a lot of supports in place to help our companies to travel where, where they can do so, but also to make that introduction between investors and strategic partners with these uh, fantastic lineup of startups. How important is it now for many of these companies? It's first round investment, isn't it? Effectively seed capital that a lot of what we're going to see today are looking for. Yeah, so all of these, I would say, are on the cusp of commercialization. All of these HPSUs from research are just starting that investment journey, you know, and are here looking to get investment. And what we see is that, yeah, investment continues to come um, in Europe. We see a lot of VC investment in Europe, but I suppose, unfortunately, less than 10% is in that first round of investment, which is where a lot of our startups are. So. Today is a great opportunity to showcase the commercial potential and I suppose the track record of these disruptive deep tech companies. They might be high risk, but they're certainly high, high reward. And the stats say that, Matt. Of course, we have a majority of the presentations today are going to be made by women. How important do you think is that for the development of the sector? 
hugely, hugely important. I mean, it's, it's a topic of constant discussion and, and it's something that's been core to what Enterprise Ireland has been looking at for a long time, that gender balance and get more, getting more female-led entrepreneurs and female-led founders. And I'm delighted that seven of the 12 pitches here today are, are females. But it is a challenging environment because, again, we, we see that investment into female uh, founded startups in Europe is less than 3%. Why is that? A number of things, I suppose. First of all, there's an imbalance in the investment community, and I think that there's more. We're starting to see happen at Europe. There's, there's um, initiatives going on to get more females involved in the investment community. And I suppose also for us with our females, it's, it's helping them to under, understand the mindset of the, I, I suppose the, dare I say, it, the, the imbalance in gender and how they can put their um, best foot forward. And, and I suppose be at, be at the forefront versus a lot of these technologies that are male led. Yeah, but surely a good idea is a good idea, whether it comes from a man or comes from a woman. A good idea is a good idea, and if it's an investable opportunity, it will be. But I suppose the problem is that female, that female founders and their, them having a voice at the table and being heard, it's certainly more of a struggle. And, and I think there's an onus on us um, as government agency and an onus on investors to really give women that, that time and that space to pitch. Oh, because it's not just about money as well, what about mentoring and guidance? How important is that as well? Absolutely, you know, um, money is important and a lot of people can, can provide funding, but actually where we see um, the most important support is that peer-to-peer -peer learning, learning from the leaders that have gone ahead of you, that mentor support, that business and commercial support. And that's actually core to a lot of what we're doing with our HPSUs from research is not only giving these candidates access to the funding to bring their idea to the market, but it's giving them access to um, business partners, to commercial promoters, to people that really can help them to overcome all of the sort of hurdles you will have with these deep, deep tech startups. There's a developing and perhaps worrying trend starting to develop across all of business of an unavailability of talent. It's becoming very difficult for many established companies to hire people and to retain people because of the options are available. What about for startup companies? How much of an issue is that? Absolutely, and I'm sure you're going to hear today from our candidates attracting and retaining talent. It's, um, it's probably, I would say, the biggest challenge that we, we face both for um, established and for startup companies. And again, I think for our, and today's a great opportunity. Why is that? Why do you think it is an issue at present? Well, because it's, it's um, uh, on for, well, I suppose there's such a, a skills gap and there's a skills gap for sort of the technologies of the future. So those jobs of five years ago are no longer the jobs that we need. And you're going to see today the convergence of technology even in, in healthcare, what you're going to have is you can have somebody who's a great medical engineer, but do they know about advanced technology? Do they know about AI? And so it's the convergence of the skills and people having that and not being new to the area. That's something, it's a struggle to find those people. And now in the virtual environment, you know, you can be based anywhere in the world and you can get a job any in the world. You don't need to be physically there. So again, that means that the world is your oyster for a lot of these really, really highly skilled people. They can have jobs all over the world. So um, it's something we need to look at. And, and it, I suppose from, from an Enterprise Ireland perspective, as we develop our new strategy out, the skills agenda and attracting and retaining ta talent is a top priority for us. Looking at the 12 companies that will be presenting here today, a couple of things jumped out at me. One is that they seem to be making products that are going to make people's lives better and also that many of them are going to reduce the cost significantly for their customers. Are those the themes that you saw or are there other ones as well? No, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, we've just come through, you know, a global pandemic and the, the future of healthcare and the market has been disrupted forever. So what you're seeing is um, those um, startups and companies that can actually keep people out of hospitals, keep people at home, um, that can manage people and actually prevent people from getting ill. They're the sort of the technologies of the future. But again, it's not your, um, purely about the, the, 
the medical devices. It's about artificial intelligence. It's about machine learning. It's about being able to make sure that people continue to be monitored um, in, an, in an environment that isn't necessarily a hospital environment. And that's what you're seeing coming through today. In addition to technologies, which is about um, encouraging and empowering employers to attract and retain their, their staff. So even though that's not a healthcare um, opportunity as such, it absolutely could be used within the healthcare environment. But it's not all healthcare, and there are other products uh, and services here been offered today as well, which are very strong about the whole idea of making things cheaper, cheaper. for customers. Absolutely, and so, you know, one of the companies that you're going to see here, it, it's all going to be about absolutely reducing the cost of broadcasting production, you know, because again, we're moving to a virtual environment in terms of broadcasting, and particularly in terms of live events and um, and that's what that's what the customer is looking for. They want the same um, they want the same product, but they want it at a cheaper cost where possible. Okay, well that's just one of the twelve that we'll be getting to in a little while. Deirdre, thank you very much for being with us and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. So before we get to the twelve pitches, let's remember a little bit of what happened last year. So as what we do at this event every year is we have a video of some of the companies that pitched last year, in this case twenty twenty, to find out how they're doing now. So let's have a look. Welcome to the 13th year of Big Ideas, Enterprise Ireland's showcase of the most promising spin-outs emerging from the state's investment in the commercialization of research with the support of Enterprise Ireland. Every year, we present 12 emerging spin-out companies that Enterprise Ireland believes have the capacity to take their research to the next level, to create investable, scalable, and sustainable businesses. This year, we are looking back at four companies that presented at Big Ideas in 2020. We will hear how they progressed and the achievements and milestones they have reached during the last 12 months. The four companies are Biologit, Inclusio, Synthesis Medical and Vertigenius. As ambitious and committed founders, they are excellent role models for the 12 spin-outs pitching live from the studio today as well as the many other research scientists and future spin-out teams joining us online that are at an earlier stage of their research commercialization journey. I'm Dr. Dara Meldrum, I'm the CEO and founder of Vertigenius. Vertigenius is a medical device with a digital platform to provide rehabilitation for patients who've got dizziness, vertigo or imbalance. So I had done my PhD in the area of technology in rehabilitation and I'd used an off-the-shelf gaming platform and it was at that point that I realised we could actually use this technology but it needs to be much better. So that was about probably about five, six years ago now. So I approached a few computer scientists and engineers and we got a small grant where we started putting the idea together and from then on I went approached Enterprise Ireland, did the feasibility study and then got the two commercialisation funds which helped me to finish out the product. The patient themselves gets an app that they download on their phone and they also get a wearable sensor. And the wearable sensor just sits on the ear, um, just here. It connects via Bluetooth to the phone and it allows us to track that important parameter of head movement. So we can see whether the patient is doing the exercise at the right speed, and we can also see what their symptoms are. So we can see if we're making them worse or better, or we need to just adjust it just so that they're doing the optimal type of exercise. So taking part in the Big Ideas was a massive opportunity for us, and it allowed us really just to reach investors and to showcase our product. And since going on Big Ideas, we've had a lot of interest from investors. We're trying to raise our seed round at the moment. And we've also managed to finish the product, get it CE marked and get it fully regulated as a class one medical device. Enterprise Ireland have been an amazing support for us. In fact, this product would not have happened if it hadn't been for Enterprise Ireland. The supports that they give to third level researchers in order to spin out uh, companies and to commercialise their research are second to none. And every time I've had a question, every time I've had a problem, somebody at Enterprise Ireland has been able to help me solve it. So my name is Tim Jones and I'm CEO of Synthesis Medical. And along with Michelle Tierney, we're trying to build a medical device company that's aiming to treat patients that suffer from a buildup of fluid um, around the chest that's brought on from late stage cancers. And our device uh, enables patients to treat themselves at home um, rather than in the hospital setting. 
going into big ideas, it was all about trying to get across what our value proposition is. That whole process of pulling the pitch together was as valuable as pitching and then eventually getting um, you know, the discussion after the event. So we've built our roadmap out now, um, and that's something which is necessary in order to get the buy-in from investors um, and all of the stakeholders that are working with us. It's been huge what we've completed in the last 12 months, and now we're very much in the execution stage. So my name is Michelle Tierney. I'm co-founder and chief scientific officer of Synthesis Medical. So since Big Ideas, we've been able to step up our involvement with our um, clinical mentor who is actually based in the University Hospital of Galway, Dr. David Breen. We are now kicking off our first inpatient study that's planned for early 2022, where we're going to test a component of our device um, with real patients to get feedback on how, again, we can improve it um, for the wider patient population in the future. Enterprise Island have been critical, crucial, uh, just invaluable to us um, to date and they've been on the journey with us for the last three years and been a massive support. We're now in the high potential startup phase. They've, they've continued to support us all the way through the journey and, and they're not letting go yet. My name is Sandra Healy and I'm CEO and founder of Inclusio. We provide a data-led, scientific, evidence-based approach to diversity and inclusion in work. Before I joined Inclusio, I spent 20 years in the telecoms industry, working across the UK and Ireland, and then the last five years I've spent working in Dublin City University. And one of the things I realised when I was in industry is that I had really clear KPIs on one side of the work I was doing, so sales, customer delivery, customer experience, and yet here I was doing this very meaningful work in diversity and inclusion with no way to evidence the impact uh, to the organisation. So I went into DCU as Head of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion for the University and in my discussions and going into the university I said I have an idea, I want to build a software platform, do you think we're going to be able to do that together? And they said absolutely, we have Enterprise Ireland, commercialisation funding and DCU Invent. So Enterprise Ireland have been a fantastic support for us right from the very beginning. So we worked uh, with Enterprise Ireland uh, through the commercialization application and uh, they supported us through all the research and development within the university. And since we've spun out now, we are part of the HPSU unit. Big ideas for me was the start of what is and has been a very exciting year. And thankfully, uh, we have done extremely well since then. So we had customers that were willing to come on board with us from the, the day we stepped out of the university. Uh, and that started my journey in fundraising. Personally, I think Big Ideas was phenomenal because you get access to the investors, uh, you get access to Enterprise Ireland, and you, get your, you become part of an ecosystem of other entrepreneurs. So my name is Nicole Baker. I'm the co-founder of Biologit. Biologit develops technology using AI for the monitoring of the scientific and medical literature, looking for adverse events for drugs. And the, the purpose of our product is for pharmaceutical companies and regulatory authorities to be able to monitor the drugs that are in the market or in clinical development. We started as an academic lab in the ADAPT, Trinity College Dublin and we received a commercialization fund to develop the idea. And we are at the very moment where we are spinning out of Trinity and becoming a commercial company where we're able to, to go to market and commercialize the product. Throughout the whole development, um, I think Enterprise Ireland and TCD, they have been very, very um, helpful in, in all that we needed and supporting us because I come from the industry. I hadn't started a company before or a new idea, so that, that was the first for me and for the co-founder as well, Bruno Hanna. When we pitch uh, Big Ideas, the company was at the stage of still developing the software itself and building the AI models. So we were close enough to kind of spinning out, but not there yet. This is one product that we're developing. We already have ideas for further developing other products or to improving this product. So it's only starting and there's a, a long road <laughs> for us to go. If there was one piece of advice I could give to people who are pitching today, it would be nobody knows your business better than you do. I always say, get out of your own way. 
You started your business for a reason, you're here for a reason. So relax, trust yourself that it's in your head and you've got it. So for me, the most important part was this was going to go out um, and, and be recorded. So this was going to be a snapshot in time that I wanted uh, people to look at in the future and to go, okay, that's what Synthesis Medical are about. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't about winning at all. It was very much about just putting our best foot forward. So participating is really the most important thing about Big Ideas today. Uh, it's not about winning, it's about distilling down your idea, it's about refining your value proposition and it's about being introduced to investors and raising the profile of your business. The stories that you have heard are just a snapshot of the amazing research commercialisation work that is taking place every day at our higher educational institutions. For all the research scientists joining us today, if you have an idea or piece of research which you believe has commercial potential, please approach your technology transfer office and they will introduce you to Enterprise Ireland's research commercialization team who can help you navigate the journey from idea to investment. So it's great to see the enthusiasm from last year's event evident again in that video. So let's get to this year's event. Let me explain the rules again. There are three minutes for each pitch. There is a countdown clock on stage, and I won't be allowing anyone to go over those three minutes. I will be asking follow-up questions, and the pitchers have no idea what I might ask them. It's totally off the cuff, but hopefully will allow us to learn a little bit more. Remember that you can be involved even if you're not physically present today. There's a viewer's choice award where you can vote on the poll once you are logged in. The poll is now open. Only those who have entered their details for a Slideo will be able to vote. The voting panel should be on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're watching via the EI website, though, you will not be able to vote. There's also One to Watch Award presented at the end of the event. This is judged by the EI directors and is based solely on the pitch today. So let's go to our first presentation. Antoinette Perry is Associate Professor of Cell and Molecular Bi Biology and Co-Director of the Cancer Biology and Therapeutics Laboratory at University College Dublin. She's the inventor, CEO and co-founder of EpiCapture. EpiCapture is a urine DNA test for the early detection of aggressive prostate cancer. Currently supported by an Enterprise Ireland commercialization fund, she is presenting the commercial opportunity on behalf of her team. Antoinette, your three minutes start now. Thank you. Over the next three minutes, I want to change the way you think about urine. Most people don't give it a second thought, but what if I told you that urine is like liquid gold for cancer detection and monitoring? Our team are developing an accurate, painless and cost-effective urine test for aggressive prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is a huge global problem. It's the most common non-skin cancer in men right across the developed world where one in seven men will develop this condition and 370,000 men die every year from this disease. So early detection is essential to save lives. The problem is that the current blood test for prostate cancer is like flipping a coin. There's a 50% chance that an abnormal result will have absolutely nothing to do with cancer. This results in millions of invasive, traumatic and expensive transrectal biopsies, most of which are unnecessary. Our solution is EpiCapture, a simple urine in vitro diagnostic to help decide who and when to biopsy. It uses a proven PCR platform already widely available around the world for diseases such as COVID-19. Our results to date on over 900 patients have proven that EpiCapture can detect over 85% of aggressive prostate cancers, whilst improving the specificity of competitor tests by over 90%. We've also shown that EpiCapture can predict tumor recurrence and overall survival up to 10 years later. This is an incredibly powerful result because it shows the potential for EpiCapture to save lives. I've been working in this field for over 15 years, collaborating with key opinion leaders in Europe, the US and Asia. My team have been supported by grant funding of 1.7 million euro, and we've patent protected EpiCapture in key target markets. 
our route to market is a well-trodden path by successful molecular diagnostic companies, suggesting VC-type returns are available. We're seeking strategic partnerships and investment to take EpiCapture through prospective clinical trials and regulatory approval in the US and Europe with first revenues in 2024. The serviceable, obtainable market suggests that EpiCapture op market opportunity is in the region of 1 billion. To summarize, we believe that EpiCapture is liquid gold for prostate cancer detection and monitoring with the power to eradicate unnecessary invasive transrectal biopsies, save on healthcare costs, and most importantly, improve quality of life for patients and their families. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoinette. Could you explain overdiagnosis to me? Because I think that is something that you hope your product will be able to overcome. Yeah, that's a very good point. So um, prostate cancer, sometimes we hear the phrase that many men die with rather than because of their disease. So it's a very heterogeneous disease and it's about catching those cancers that have the potential to become lethal because most of them that don't. So that's why we need a selective test to detect the aggressive tumours. How accurate is your test likely to be and at what stage of a cancer's development will you be able to catch it? So we've shown that our test is extremely accurate and the two really important metrics for considering a diagnostic test are the sensitivity and the specificity. So as I said, we've shown at least 85% sensitivity and comparable specificity, meaning it's extremely accurate. And we've also shown that we can use it very early on um, in the, in the tumour journey, so for early detection. So how do those numbers compare with existing products? So the sensitivity is comparable with existing competitors, but it's really the specificity where EpiCapture has been, uh, we've shown it to be best in class. And this offers significant opportunity for the, the monitoring market of men with low risk prostate cancer to detect these disease progression. I presume the health authorities would also be interested in knowing how much are these tests going to cost by comparison with the existing tests? So we expect EpiCapture to price competitively, but that's something we'll need to discuss with strategic partners down the road. So you have you an idea, a firm idea at the present of how much it might cost? Um, and we're in expecting in the region of $500 or €430 Euros per test. Okay, Antoinette, thank you very thank much you for very joining much. us here. Good luck to you. Okay, let's move on to our next presenter, Dr. Brian Slattery, CEO and co-founder of Worky. Worky is an employee experience and change management platform assisting frontline and mobile, mobile workforces in particular that helps leaders and human resources understand the needs of their people in real time and to drive measurable improvements. Along with his fellow founders, Barry Gordon, the CTO, and Paddy Doyle, the CFO, the team is in the final stages of the Enterprise Ireland Commercialisation Fund and is preparing to spin out of Dublin City University. Brian, your three minutes start now. Thank you. One in two people are a frontline or mobile worker and they need workplace supports. The pandemic has saw the rise of technology to assist office-based workers, but 60% of the US workforce, for example, do not sit at a desk. Mobile and frontline workers uh, cover a broad range of roles from engineers, doctors and nurses to hospitality and gig economy workers. Right now, we're in the middle of the great resignation. Job demands for these people are high. Um, work conditions can be tough and recruitment and um, retention extremely difficult. So identifying issues such as cultural or well-being problems and intervening before they arise is important for both the employee and for leadership. Unbelievably, more than 80% of companies still use low-quality, biased and out-of-date data and tools like SurveyMonkey and Excel to inform human capital decisions. This approach is limited, it's inefficient and costly. By 2024, there will be 94 million frontline and mobile workers alone in the US. As such, there's a clear unmet need to support this workforce, it's a clear unmet need to support this workforce, and this results in a market opportunity of $1.1 billion. At Worky, we have launched the first convenient, cost-effective, and dedicated platform for mobile and frontline workforces. Worky is a mobile-optimized, cloud-based platform that uh, combines best practice, uh, people science, data analytics, and evidence-based solutions. From, with Worky, employees feel empowered to share information, and leadership can identify issues in their dis distributed workforces in the moment, take action, and drive measurable improvements. 
Worky is simple to use and proven to be effective. As one global head of HR said, it's great to see data back up our decisions. We are working with five clients. We have two in uh, late stage preparation and we have another uh, 20 to 25 in our customer pipeline. We have a stellar team behind Worky. I'm an assistant professor of behavioral science and I lead a team of PhDs and experts in artificial intelligence, behavioral science and software engineering. Our CTO has, developed, has built applications for some of the world's largest companies, and our CFO has had multiple exits, including in HR technology. We've established a scientific and uh, commercial advisory board, which includes one of the world's leading industry analysts. And there, from an investment perspective, there are significant opportunities with multiple examples of acquisitions, uh, most recently for 700 million euros. So in summary, Worky uh, is live and delivering benefits to customers. We have a world-class team. There is a massive market opportunity. Um, we're in the dawn of a new era of workplace technology. Work is positioned to be a global player in the mobile and distributed workforces. And we are looking to speak to strategic investors who share our passion, who share our vision, and ultimately share our global ambition. Thank you very much. Brian, this product, is it the application, is it a website or is it an app? What is it? It's actually all of the above. It's a, a mobile application um, that captures information from employees on the go, but we also uh, push out things like psychometric surveys, uh, feedback and so on through text messaging and that, and then that comes back into a web portal and, um, and, and we kind of aggregate and understand the data. Yeah, you just partly answered the question I was going to ask. What sort of information is actually included and who inputs it and then who's it for, the employer or the employee? That's great. Okay, so it, the input comes in in various different ways. So there's kind of like behavioral science or psychometric uh, surveys, measures that go out. Uh, we can also take back in feedback and we also uh, take in kind of targeted like diagnostic surveys. So the employee inputs this information. Um, and it goes back into the system, we aggregate it up, and it comes out in a dashboard, a live dashboard then for leadership, HR, and so forth. But ultimately, the employee's in a loop because they get to see what's going on with their data, um, and this kind of spurs on more information, um, uh, 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 kind of input, that if you want to put it. Surveys recently have shown that a lot of companies, though, are gathering an enormous amount of data which they don't use or don't understand how to use. So how are you going to make this actually usable? That's actually uh, a really good question. So I suppose that all comes down into what we capture and why we capture, and that comes back down to our experience in doing this. So I suppose my career has been around understanding people, capturing the right information and displaying it in the right time. And so what we do is we've taken a lot of care and due diligence building up our platform to, under, to take the appropriate information uh, at the right time and render it back to people. But we only use, and that's the key thing, we, we only use that information that we need, and ultimately, that's why we bring employees into the loop so they can actually see what's going on. How do you deal with data protection issues? Well, that's a number one priority. So everything that we've built is GDPR compliant. We use the latest and uh, state of the art in terms of industrial uh, security measures. So literally, data protection is everything to us. Thank you very much, and best Thank of luck with your future you in that. Lynn Markey is our next speaker. She's the CEO and co-founder of Extremity Medical, a surgical device company developing treatments for chronic wound infections. Along with her co-founder, Camille O'Malley, the team is in the final stages of an Enterprise Ireland commercialization fund and is preparing for spin-out from NUIG next year. Lynn. Thank you. Feet. We take them for granted every single day to get about. But can you imagine your life without them? This is the risk for millions of diabetics every year who develop a foot ulcer, with one in two becoming infected. These infections are devastating for patients, leading to hundreds of thousands of amputations every year. Patients go from living independent lives to care homes where their life expectancy is drastically cut short. Extremity Medical are developing a surgical device to treat these infections and improve patient outcomes. These infections are so complex to treat because they reside in the deep muscle and bone tissue. And because of that, antibiotics alone are not sufficient and surgery is required to remove the infection. The surgeon's challenge is to remove all the infection, but they're blind to where the infection is and cannot guarantee it's been fully removed. Therapy is available to assist the surgeon in removing the infection have no proven clinical benefit because they either only treat the surface of the wound or they use mechanical forces that can propel the infection deeper into the wound. Because of this, one in two surgeries fail and patients require additional surgeries. Extremity can make a real difference to these patients. We're developing a surgical device that delivers electrical pulses to the wound to zap any bacteria remaining in the wound margins. 
We've demonstrated this technology is effective with a thousand-fold reduction in the bacterial burden compared to the standard of care. Earlier this year, we carried out a large animal study to demonstrate the safety of this technology. And wound margins that are free of bacteria reduce surgical procedures by 27% and hospital stays by 40%. And this is how Extremity can save hospitals money. This disruptive technology is a class two medical device with a patent pending and reimbursement is available for rapid market adoption. As a team, we're uniquely positioned to bring this device to patients with a background in science, electronic engineering and med tech innovation. And we're supported by a global network of clinical and commercial advisors. The market opportunity for a device that treats infection is over 5 billion euro. There really are no good solutions for these patients. Initially, Extremity will target diabetic foot infections with scope to expand into the wider infection market to include surgical site infections, trauma infections, and chronic wound infections. To summarize, Extremity are developing a surgical device to treat all bone and soft tissue infections with a potential market opportunity of 5 billion euro. We're currently raising a seed round to get to first in human studies, and we're looking for investment partners to join us on this journey. Thank you. Lynn, thank you for that. Can you just explain to me, how does an electrical pulse or signal actually work to deal with an infection? Sure, so the electrical pulses can treat both the surface and below the surface. And what it does is you can hone the parameters of that pulse to target the smaller bacterial cells over the, the human cells. And what it does is it creates pores in the cell membrane, which basically kill the bacterial cells. Is anybody else doing anything like that at present? There have been some uh, devices that have used electrical pulses, but they've only been used in animal models because how they deliver the technology is they have to pinch the, the tissue between the electrodes, which isn't suitable for these type of infections. And where Extremity are unique is that we've designed our device to deliver the technology in a non-invasive fashion. Now, how long before you get a patent and what difference will that make to you? Sure, so we filed our first patent earlier this year. Um, and we're waiting for the search report on that. Um, and that will give us protection for this device, the design of this device. And what sort of interest has been shown by others in assisting you at this stage in relation to investment or whatever? Because this seems like an idea that particularly could have major cost savings involved. Absolutely. We've taken a very unique approach to, to treating these infections. Previously, it's been using either chemical chemicals or mechanical forces and so this is using electrical pulses is a very different approach and so there's a lot of excitement and a lot of potential with using this type of technology to treat these very severe infections that can be really devastating for patients. And in medical circles are the people asking about this because it is unique as you say as to how would they have expressed doubts about effectiveness if nobody else has really done it? Yeah, so we have um, clinical advisors throughout the States and in Europe, and they're all very excited to see the potential of this technology. Um, and obviously that will be backed up with clinical data as we progress through. Thank you very much for being with us and best of luck for the future. Thanks so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Johan Isartel, who is an associate professor at DCU and co-founder of Move Ahead with Dr. Jamie McGann. Move Ahead is tackling the movement crisis in childhood with the first motion control and movement platform built specifically for children. Move Ahead powers digital play, toys and games and sport that move children in the digital world. Johan and the team are in the final stages of an Enterprise Ireland commercialisation fund and ready to spin out a DCU in early 2022. Johan, your three minutes start now. Thank you very much. Nowadays, children prefer the PlayStation to the playground. 90% of children have poor movement skills. They can no longer hop, skip, jump or even run properly. This movement crisis has a potential catastrophe for public health. Poor movement skills lead children to avoid physical activity for life. We also know sedentary behavior is on the rise. Students spend on average six hours a day sitting in front of a screen. And the billion app Kids App Markets is using this. They want to meet the children where they are. But they also want to alleviate parental guilt and negotiate those negative perceptions. So the market leaders are on the move. They're starting to shift to introduce kids, uh, motion tracking technology, which is turning the users into a body controller. When they do this, they're using motion capture that is built on adult, adult data. And it doesn't work for children. It's neither safe, accurate, or educational. 
So how do we move ahead? We are providing this first motion tracking solution entirely built on children data and children movement science. We have an enormous reach as our solution run on any device with a camera. But crucially, we have embedded a privacy by design approach so that our solution is not only healthy, educational, and fun, it's by design really safe for children. Move Ahead is at the call phase. We have embedded tier one company like Decathlons, helping them to build healthy motion tracking solutions as part of virtual coaching, sports, and educational apps. Move Ahead is called now the movement maker, but actually we go just a lot more deeper than just movement. Indeed, Move Ahead has the potential to embed in that with our partners a way to track children, but more importantly, to evaluate, analyze, and understand where they are so that our companies can really help children to move better and to help them to enjoy, engage better, and have better learning pathways. We have, the more children interact with our technology, the more powerful our algorithms become. And this will sustain our lead over future competitors. We have a really talented team with rare expertise in children movement science and data analytics we have a clear route to market and exciting customer. Now, we are looking for strategic investors ready to actively engage with us to transform the way children interact with technology for good. The world has changed from Hopscotch and Leapfrog to now TikTok and YouTube. The world is different. Let's give the children the best of both worlds. Move Ahead is providing a solution that is safe, accurate, and educational for children and your time is up. I want to ask, is this a physical device, something that the child wears, or is it something that's built into the technologies they're already using? That's exactly it. So we are basically, we are helping companies. We are supporting, we are there in the background. We have an API and an SDK, this kind of solution that can plug in into existing platforms that our clients have. So we're helping them to basically transform what they have and inject movement into what they do or we also build with them a brand new solution to really transform the way they can use motion tracking in their solutions. So it's software effectively that's totally. loaded onto the physical devices that they may Physical device, so it can run on a mobile phone, it can run on a camera with a laptop, for example. Um, you can see that in, in any device really where there's a camera. How, that, how does that encourage the child to start moving? So what you encourage them to start moving is basically is what I was saying earlier, it's, like it's not just movement, because when the child moves, we need to tell them what they are doing well and what they are not doing so, so well. So we're putting them in these learning pathways. So where are we coming with 15 years of science and expertise there? So the motion tracking is not that hard. Everybody can do that. Move Ahead is unique in the sense that we understand where the children are and we can help them learning and keep moving. In what way? And so the way we are doing this, we're extracting the way they are moving and we're giving them feedback. We are supporting their learning through all the secret sources we have where we can from the movement they do, we know where to need to go next. And this little motion was like, oh, this is tricky, I don't know how to do something. Just really stimulate that really sweet post there where it's like, oh, I can't do that. And you challenge them and then they progress and their motor skills improve. What about data protection issues? So that's absolutely core and I think I mentioned this. So we are not extracting any images. We are using cameras, but you're not extracting images for the camera, from these cameras. We are only using math behind that, so it's just numbers that comes, so this completely GDPR and also COPA compliant for the US market. Johan, thank you very thank much you for your much presentation. You. Our next presentation comes from Aaron Hannan, who is co-founder and the CEO of Luminite Medical, a company which aims to build medical devices that prevent the side effects of cancer treatment. The company's first product is a device to prevent chemotherapy-induced hair loss, developed by Aaron alongside co-founders Dr. Barbara Oliveira and Professor Martin O'Halloran. The team is now raising funds to power inpatient clinical trials beginning next year. Aaron, your three minutes start now. We're Luminate Medical, and we're building a device to prevent hair loss caused by chemotherapy. I'd like to begin with a quote from a patient we interviewed recently who is undergoing treatment for breast cancer. She said, losing your hair is what makes you realize what's really happening to you. It reminds you every day. It's the hardest part of the whole chemotherapy experience. At Luminate, we're on a mission to 
relieve patients of the burdens of the side effects of cancer treatment. To do this, we've built a novel compression therapy, which we use to prevent drug delivery to specific target areas of the body. That means that we can target and prevent the side effects of drugs like chemotherapy. Using this approach, we've built a medical device to prevent chemo-induced hair loss. The Lily device is a portable, comfortable, self-contained cap which patients can use to prevent hair loss during chemotherapy. They wear it during and for 90 minutes after every chemotherapy treatment to prevent hair loss in a simple, comfortable, and effective way. We've already used our approach to prevent hair loss across a 120 animal study, and we've shown our device is safe and effective at minimizing drug delivery to the hair follicles in a clinical study with healthy humans. Our next step is a clinical study with patients beginning next year. Every year, three million cancer patients in the US and Europe are at risk of hair loss because of their chemotherapy treatment, creating a $4.5 billion market opportunity. With over 84% of cancer patients buying a wig at an average spend of $1,000 each, there's huge demand in the space. We've already had unprecedented demand to trial our product, leading to partnerships with Yale Cancer Center and Mass General Hospital. But solving chemo-induced hair loss is only our first indication. We're developing a portfolio of products based on the IP we've already filed that will revolutionize quality of life care for cancer patients. Our team combines the necessary clinical, technical, and commercial expertise to execute on this opportunity. As CEO, I bring the experience of being a serial entrepreneur. Our CTO has built medical devices and run clinical trials for cancer patients and our team is completed by the director of BioInnovate and the former CEO of Slendertone. We're already funded by Enterprise Ireland's DTIF program, Y Combinator, and Peter Thiel, among others. And investors in our business have access to exciting exit opportunities, with pharmaceutical strategics already showing inbound interest in our company. Precedent exits for comparable companies have ranged from 100 million at FDA approval, all the way to $1 billion exits in less than 10 years. We're seeking the right partner to accelerate our mission to change the face of cancer treatment. Because life is about more than just surviving. Life is about living. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Aaron, what's in this cap that when you wear it, it can prevent hair loss? So we have a pneumatic bladder system which covers the surface of the scalp inside the cap. And what that does is it applies our unique compression therapy and allows us to prevent drug delivery to the hair, protecting it from chemotherapy while it's being metabolized by the body. So this particular cap, is it used once or is it something that would be used for the full duration of uh, chemotherapy treatment? Yeah, so every time a patient comes back for chemotherapy treatment, they wear this device while they're receiving their infusion and then for 90 minutes afterwards. And the key benefit with our portable device is that the patient can leave the clinic during that time and go home and continue their life. Is it reusable though or is it, or is it just for one patient or can it be shared between different patients? So our device is specific to each individual patient that's using the technology, and it's really important that we know who's using the device, because for safety reasons, we're, sub, uh, we're restricted to treating only patients with solid tumors, so we need to make sure that the patient that's using the device is the one that we think is using the device. Okay, and how much is it likely to cost? So initially, the device will cost $1,500 when we produce it on the US market for the first time. However, we're working really hard on uh, getting reimbursement, and recently there's been reimbursement codes introduced for this need, so that patients will actually only have a small copay, and insurance will cover the bulk of the cost. How difficult is it going to be to get it manufactured to the required standards? So that's definitely a really interesting question for us, and we're really happy to partner with local SMEs, such as Gentian Services, who are based in Shannon, who are helping us to manufacture this product to the highest possible standard. How far have you gone in the development of it? So we're really excited to just be about to launch our first inpatient studies, which is really exciting for us, and we'll see our first patients experiencing the benefit of the Lilly technology. And then will that mean looking for FDA approval? Off the back of that, we'll be going for 510K approval to launch in the US market at the start of 2024. Aaron, thank you very much for being with us Thanks today. Best of luck for the future with that. Okay, now our next uh, presentation involves a little bit of equipment been brought out onto the stage as well. And the presentation is going to be made by Marteza Matkan, who is the co-founder of Illumini Tech. Now this is a UCD spin-out company which is developing smart lighting solutions with the idea of supporting occupant health and well-being. 
Along with fellow founder Sada Panahi, they de designed and developed Illumini, a novel biodynamic light and stress therapy technology to support circadian and mental health. Orteza, take it away. Daylight is the most dominant factor regulating the human circadian rhythm, releasing the hormones that wake us in the morning and send us to sleep at night. But in today's society, we're spending over 90% of our time indoors. This 24-7 inbound lifestyle has resulted in 60% of the population suffering from social jet lag. This is because our daily schedule do not correlate with sunrise and sunset anymore. Disruption to our circadian rhythm leads to poor sleep, poor performance, depression and anxiety, and many other ailments. Static artificial lighting falls short on providing the biological benefits associated with daylight. Human-centric lighting is a novel solution introduced by the lighting industry where artificial light simulates nature's day-night cycle. However, every individual circadian rhythm is slightly different to another, and current human-centric lighting technologies are an expensive, one solution for all products for a problem that is complex and personal. Also, these technologies lack the data required to provide a holistic biodynamic lighting solution. So there is a clear unmet need for an affordable, accessible, and most of all, intelligent human-centric lighting system. Illumini delivers just that. This is Illumini, an innovative biodynamic light and stress therapy technology to promote a healthy sleep-wake cycle and boost mood and productivity. Our dedicated app lets you fine-tune this light to your own body's daily rhythm and can also provide guided meditation and relaxing views to nature to ease stress and promote mental health. Illumina is a connected technology. Our AI-powered software is built upon aggregated data derived from user feedback. This data will be our secret source on what differentiates us from the competition. Human-centric lighting is a 1 billion euro opportunity and our hardware-enabled service business model will generate highly profitable and recurring revenue. We're currently seeking for funding for marketing and to launch our product to be used by early adopters in 2022. Our team is guided by dedicated professionals with more than 40 years of combined experience in lighting design and technology, computer science, and commercial know-how. In summary, Illumini delivers an affordable, accessible, an intelligent human-centric lighting solution, truly centered around the human. And we're looking for investment partners to join us in our journey. Thank you. Can I ask that particular piece of kit, do you put one of those into every house or apartment? Uh, ideally, it's for individual use, for every individual, whether you're working from home, at, at home, or at office. So it's accessible. Instead of having overhead lighting, you can travel with it, you can take it around, whether you're working from home or at home. But or how do you work with the existing lighting that you would have in your home or office? Do they get switched off or do they get in some way changed by that product? So our ecos, that's the good thing about our ecos ecosystem is during the day, the overhead lighting, the, your home lighting, they don't have the intense bright light to promote the circadian stimulation that you'll need. Uh, now with this device, through our application, we can uh, provide data to our users about the, la the light that they'll need at home at night. So you'll need less light and more at, at night and more light at, during the day. So basically we can provide that information to our users. But is this a product suited only to people living perhaps on their own? Because what happens if you have a situation where you have a family, like you have in my house, there are seven of us with all different sleeping patterns and different circadian rhythms? Of course. So the current human-centric lighting solutions that are promoting this, they promote um, the prescribed light based on your ge geographical system. So the sunrise and sunset of the place that you're living. So they simulate that. that. So what we're doing is um, we're bringing the chrome, human prototype. So it's a step before that. We're learning from individual users. And in time, we'll know we'll have the right um, algorithm based on user feedback. And we can prescribe a holistic lighting solution based on human feedback. And very briefly, this may seem a bit left field, but it's been keeping with the times. Will it in any way help with people's carbon footprint? Uh, yeah, well, this is using LED. So LEDs are inherently uh, uh, low energy usage. So that's, that will help, yep. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. You. Okay, well, we're just going to move that little bit of equipment off the stage as well and get our next 
Pitcher ready to join us on the stage. Dr. Emma Carr is the co-founder and chief scientific officer at Amara Therapeutics. Emma is a psychologist who specializes in digital health. Amara Therapeutics is pioneering a new treatment for overactive bladder. It's in the final stages of an Enterprise Ireland commercialization fund and is preparing for spin out from NUI Galway. Emma, your three minutes start now. US health insurance companies spend $12 billion annually on a condition called overactive bladder, or OAB. OAB affects 16% of the population, and it's the result of a disruption of the signals between the brain and the bladder. This results in increased urgency and frequency of urination, which can lead to episodes of incontinence. As you can imagine, these symptoms impact every facet of a person's life. Patients feel shame and embarrassment, it disrupts their social and work lives, their sleep and sexual relationships. And these patients report higher levels of depression and anxiety. To treat OAB, best practice guidelines recommend behavioral therapy. This is proven as the most effective first line treatment. Unfortunately, there's a lack of specialists available to deliver it. And as a result, many patients are prescribed medications instead. These have unpleasant side effects like constipation, dry mouth and dizziness. That's why we've created Resolve a software-delivered therapy that gives patients another choice. Resolve is an easy-to-use, eight-week intervention that's delivered directly to the patient's mobile device. It's not another health and wellness app, it's a class two medical device that's prescribed by clinicians. Resolve delivers the proven best practice behavioral therapy and includes dietetics, physiotherapy, and psychology treatments to reduce the symptoms of OAB. Our goal is to disrupt the current treatment pathway. Resolve is cheaper than medications, has no side effects, and provides the best practice behavioral therapy. Our initial customers are US health insurance companies who currently have 14 million OAB patients under care. We can save them money and provide patients with better outcomes. At Amara Therapeutics, we have the team to get this product to market. My co-founders are Dr. Jeff Kundiff. He's our chief medical officer. He's a gynecologist with 35 years experience and key opinion leader in the US and Brendan Staunton, our CEO. He's a neuroscientist with extensive experience in medical device commercialization. I'm our chief scientific officer. I'm a psychologist with a PhD in digital health and expertise in designing clinical trials. We've just completed our observational trial in three hospitals in Ireland. Real patients <coughs> used Resolve and they all experienced a reduction in their OAB symptoms. Our next milestone is a large scale randomized controlled trial which we need to get regulatory approval from the FDA in the US. To achieve this, we've leveraged Jeff's US networks and established a partnership with MedStar Health. We're currently working with them to design our trial, which will take place across their hospitals next year. We're seeking to raise 3 million euro to gain regulatory approval and begin commercialization. Join us on our mission to transform the lives of the millions of people who suffer from OAB. Thank you. Thank you very much. Some questions for you. If an overactive bladder is a physical condition. How can you overcome it through psychological methods? Yeah, it's a great question. So it is a physiological condition, but <clears throat> our psychology can affect it um, because of its effects on our emotions and our thoughts and how they impact our behavior. So if you think about one of the main symptoms is urgency and the sense of fear that comes with that urgency that's related to the potential of, of wetting yourself. So I think we can all agree that's a very scary thought. And that drives us to <clears throat> feel anxious, feel fearful, and that can change our behaviors. One of the things people do is they go to the toilet far more frequently than they should, which weakens the bladder because it never gets to be full. They also can engage in things like toilet mapping, which is this idea of you never go to anywhere where you don't know where all the toilets are or how many toilets there are. And you see with people with overactive bladder that their world just gets smaller and smaller because of these emotions and thoughts that affect their behavior and exasperate the condition. But even if you have a positive attitude, if there is a real physical need to go, isn't that the need to go? Yes, well, the, the, that urge um, that I was speaking about is actually comes in, in a wave. And one of the treatments within, the, um, within Resolve is behavioral therapy, which is the traditional effective therapy that's used. And a key component there is urge suppression techniques and pelvic floor muscle training. So it's about retraining your bladder and, and learning how to control that urge. Do you see this as been a way of re replacing medicines as a treatment for overactive bladders? 
We would hope that it would replace medicines for a large portion of, of the, the people who suffer from OAB, yes, because it is the best practice first-line treatment. There will, of course, always be patients who need to progress down that, that treatment pathway, but we would see it, yes, for many people, they wouldn't require medications. What proof of success do you think uh, private health insurers are going to want? Um, a lot, <laughs> and we have a great plan in place. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a trial that we're currently designing to take place in America next year. That'll be a large-scale, 400 patients, um, randomized control trial. Emma, thank you very much and best Thanks of luck for the future with that. Let's go to our next presentation. Nave McElhatton is CEO and co-founder of Stimuli. Stimuli is a SaaS-based platform that acts as a strategic clinical design tool, enabling hospitals to make better capacity planning decisions in order to reduce hospital waiting lists. It's a spin-out from UCC. Nave, with the support of our co-founder, well known in the world of artificial intelligence, Professor Barry O'Sullivan, are in the middle of raising their seed fund in order to commercialize the solution. With three minutes start now. Imagine you are a loved one, lost your life whilst on a waiting list for a simple procedure. In Northern Ireland, over 22,000 people have lost their life while on NI health service waiting lists in the last five years. There's now over 7 million people in Ireland and in the UK on some form of hospital waiting list. The Irish government recently announced that they were allocating 250 million euro to solely tackle the hospital waiting list problem. And the UK government have announced that they're allocating 5.9 billion pounds to create 100 diagnostic hubs throughout the UK to tackle the backlog. Stimuli is a spin out from the University College in Cork, co-founded by myself and the prolific Professor Barry O'Sullivan. We're a SaaS platform that acts as a strategic clinical design tool that enables hospitals to make better capacity planning decisions. Through the use of machine learning, the software processes and analyzes a clinic's historical data to predict future demands. We provide evidence-based data intelligence that allows the hospitals to make the right strategic decisions when it comes to planning delivery performance. We're fully GDPR compliant as we only use anonymized data. There's no risk to utilizing stimuli as we will never worsen a hospital waiting list. We adhere to all hospital compliance and governance protocol. The beauty of our solution is that we save clinicians and their teams an abundance of time. What typically would take months of planning is now processed at a superhuman rate, giving the teams that much needed time to focus on the delivery of care for patients. Ideally, we want to start our journey in diagnostics, as typically this is where the patient journey begins too. But it's worth noting that we're not restricted to any speciality or discipline. Currently, we have four live pilots running in the UK and Ireland, and we're making great traction in the Canadian market. And our pilot results will be available in early Q1 in 2022. In one previous project with an MRI department, we were able to reduce the department's waiting time from 281 days to 24 days by simply understanding the historical data and the inefficiencies in clinical design. Our addressable market expenditure is more than 100 billion. And whilst we already have a working desktop application, we're looking to raise 600,000 to commercialize the product on Azure and to accelerate on a global market. We know our solution works, and folks' life is so very, very precious. We're very excited for you to be part of our journey. Thank you. Niamh, thank you very much for that. Can I just ask you, just for the Irish market first, uh, the HSC and our hospitals have been criticized perhaps for having old-fashioned technology, unsecure technology, some of them working on Windows 7. Is your technology going to be too advanced for many of them to be able to cope with? Well, um, to be honest, Matt, our technology is adaptable depending on what the, the software is. We're a standalone solution at the moment, so if we need to be interoperable, we can. Ideally, we'll plug in on HL7 to make it more secure and data protection and all of that. But we're standalone at the moment, so it depends. It'll totally vary on the hospital. It, it'll vary on, on what the governance and compliance is for every hospital. Believe it or not, they all, they all differ. 
not your fault, but many of these hospitals seem to be very much paper-based and haven't digitised a lot of their records. So is that going to in some way perhaps restrict the potential here in Ireland, if not overseas? No, I think with the data that we capture, um, every hospital needs to have this certain information. It just depends where it's stored at the minute. Um, and believe it or not, I have seen in the past when we've asked on how they manage their, their waiting times at the minute, they've held up an A4 leather bound diary. So it, it is an issue that needs to be addressed. It's very much an issue that needs to be addressed. But again, tell us a little bit about the GPR issues and how you're going to get around those because this confidentiality has been a major issue as well in our health system. Huge. And as I said earlier, it's all anonymized. So we don't want to know your name, anything about you. We want to know the patient type, how long your uh, appointment needs to be, and then we can subcategorize based on, on patient type, whether it's urgent, inpatient, outpatient, referral, etc. Are you going to have to manage it though on behalf of the hospitals, the SAS platform? Because there is a problem with many big organizations, they get the data and they don't know how to use it. Well, I, th I think that's fundamental, yeah, but we will um, work with the team to extrapolate the data that we need. Every speciality will have a different set. Neil, thank you very much Thanks for being very with much. us. Thank you. Paula Newell is the CEO and founder of Evita Medical. She leads a passionate team with expertise in women's health. It's a spin-out of NUI Galway and recently was one of only 64 companies across Europe awarded the EIC Accelerator Grant of 2.5 million euro. Evita Medical is excited about growing an innovative Irish company in the femtech space and providing a hormone-free, safe and effective treatment of vaginal atrophy suitable for all women. Paula, your three minutes start now. It's painful to walk because it's so like sandpaper. It's basically like sitting on a bonfire. Imagine women not engaging in exercise, sitting for long periods, or sleeping due to severe itchiness and burning. Women can no longer engage in an intimate relationship with their partners. This condition is vaginal atrophy, otherwise known as VA. It is a chronic and progressive condition. It is a consequence of reduced estrogen production. It affects over 80% of all women, generally when they reach the postmenopause stage of life. Chemotherapy also introduces um, menopause into breast cancer survivors. Vita Medical is a company on a mission to transform the VA market. They are, uh, the current treatments are hormonal therapy or over-the-counter products. They are poorly tolerated, ineffective, cause side effects and not suitable for long-term use. Women deserve, want and need better treatment options. The Vita device is the solution. The device is based on the science of wound healing, stimulating the body's own natural healing to increase moisture levels to regenerate the vaginal tissue. It comprises of a single-use monthly transvaginal tip that is connected to a smart controller. A physician will prescribe the device in, the session, in an outpatient setting and women will self-administer therapy monthly in the comfort of their own home. Evita is a patient-centric device. It offers a hormone-free, safe, affordable, long-term solution. It is suitable for all women sufferers. It is based on the naturally targeted treatment. It also is suitable for all women. It's the class two medical device, and we already have been proven in both US and European preclinical studies. The women's health market is a market ripe for disruption. There are 14.6 million women seeking treatment for VA. Our market entry point is 3.6 million women who have no current treatment option. This represents a total market opportunity of 2.5 billion. We have a defined regulatory pathway and a scalable business model. Evita Medical has a dedicated team with direct experience in launching new products in women's health. Our clinical advisory board are the key opinion leaders in women's health. So, in summary, we have a hormone-free, safe, affordable solution. It is suitable for all women sufferers. It's a long-term solution. And today, we have raised over 3 million euro in non-dilutive funding. So, in summary, we are now fundraising 2 million euro investment round to conduct both a US and European clinical studies in over the next two years. Subsequently, following regulatory approval, we will we'll reach um, US market launch in Q3 of 2024. We are looking for the right partners now to join us on this exciting femtech journey. Many thanks for listening. Paula, tell us a couple of things, please. Why would women want hormone-free solutions if they do actually work for them? Because if they weren't working, they wouldn't be using them, would they? 
Well, currently, that's the problem. There's no hormone-free solution out there. So we feel women deserve, want to need a better treatment solution, and Avita is the solution. Hormone-free solutions are only suitable for recommended two to three years. If you think a postmenopausal stage woman will get menopause at 50 years of life, women are li living longer, they're more educated, and they want hormone-free solutions. Then if you look at the other cohort of women, the breast cancer survivors. So the drugs they take to remain cancer-free further increases symptoms of vaginal atrophy. But then, hormone therapy is only considered a last resort for breast cancer survivors, because if they take hormonal therapy, increases that breast cancer will come back. Additionally, um, hormonal therapy has many side effects, so um, increases the rates for breast cancer, blood clots, um, and venous problems. Also causes depression. And if you want, you don't want to be taking hormones for like, if you're 50, you know, women hopefully are living now longer than 90, so hence they want other solutions. So, so your product, is it a cure or is it a long-term treatment? Our treatment is a class 2 medical device, so it's to be used monthly compared to what's out there. It's daily, weekly for hormone therapy or over-the-counter products. Oh, um, so it's, it's a long-term solution. The key to this solution is a chronic and progressive condition, so you need treatment that is consistent. So hence, our treatment is monthly, but it's based on the natural healing response, so it stimulates the bodies to create moisture, which in turn treats and what, What's the likely pricing going to be yeah. by comparison so, to existing products? Yeah, so if you think the pricing, we're going to be um, 700 for the first year, 600 for the second year. That's what people are already paying for over-the-counter products, which are only a temporary solution. And if you look at hormonal therapy, you could be paying up to 1,000 in the US, or depending, even though it's reimbursed. Thank you very much for Thanks. your presentation. Best of luck. Donald Scannell is the CEO and co-founder of Arama. Arama is revolutionising television outside broadcasting using AI and video processing. Donald has worked in television since 1992, and he and the Arama team are in the final stages of an Enterprise Ireland commercialisation fund and are preparing for the spin-out from the ADAPT Centre at Trinity College. Donald, your three minutes start now. Thanks, Millie Matt. And thank you so much to Enterprise Ireland for this platform. This is the launch of Arama, really. It's the first time we're talking about it out loud. The story really starts when I was four in one channel land, watching RT1, waiting for the test card to end. And I was watching Skippy from Australia and Lassie from America and Black Beauty from England. And I was wondering, were kids around the world getting to see Bosco? And from that moment on, I became obsessed with the idea of making television in Ireland for the world, to be able to address a global market from Ireland. And all these years later, Arama is the way to do it. Arama is going to revolutionise live television, starting with outside broadcasts. Now, outside broadcasts are when television leaves the studio and goes out on location, mostly for sports. It hasn't fundamentally changed since 1948. You take a big truck, you take loads of people, you plug cameras in, and away you go. We turn all that on its head with Arama. We get lots of locked off cameras and we set them around a defined space. And our software intelligently selects views from within the 8K pictures we shoot. That means that we can deliver, um, we're starting with soccer by the way, because soccer, there's two billion a year spent televising soccer. That's excluding rights. We're starting with soccer because it's always good to start at the top. We are going to film a soccer game and deliver for 5,000 euros what currently costs a broadcaster 40,000 euros. We are going to revolutionize the business models of our customers and allow them to cover 200 games for what they're currently spending 30 games covering. We are building our MVP with the Department of Electronic Engineering in Trinity College. Anil Kokram, who leads that department and is leading our MVP, will be our CSO. He's won an Oscar for his work in art artificial intelligence and video. We're spinning out from Trinity in September. We've got Premier Sports and RT Sports, our trial partners, and that has allowed us to film soccer games for the last year, and we're training our algorithm what to look for, and we're training our algorithm as to what's important. The key thing about Arama as well is we are going to build up an international broadcast centre in Dublin where we will have directors and producers cutting the games that we're feeding back from base and delivering pictures to the world. We're starting with soccer, then we're going after the rest of sport, and then we're going after all kinds of live events and we'll move back in traditional studios. Um, 
it's been an amazing adventure so far. And the mad thing is, it all makes sense to me. It feels like something I've been building up to for 30 years. And uh, thank you so much for having me here today and for allowing us this platform. Thank you. Donald, this is the one topic today I have some personal experience of. Uh, how do you manage to capture the off-the-ball incidents that often the cameramen there actually aren't necessarily always following the ball, but the other things that are going on? And you're right, those off-the-ball incidents, they're the bits of drama that really make it. We're semi-automating the process. We're not 100% automating it. So our main camera person, our number one camera person, is an actual person, and he or she will be doing 40% of average what goes out in screen time. We have a director back at base and a producer. So we have that human layer and our customers love that. The broadcasters love the fact we're not trying to fully automate it, that it's a semi-automated process. What about the truck? The truck is where the producers, the directors are. They have all the screens of all the feeds coming from the camera and they decide what the output is for live television. What happens to the truck? That truck is our base in Dublin. The pictures are fed back to Dublin and selected there. There is no truck. There is no truck. No okay. truck. So how many people are going to end up losing their jobs in this process? Well, it's not losing their jobs. We're creating a whole new class of higher skilled, higher paid work based in Dublin. And Dublin will become the epicenter of live television globally. So we're elevating um, a whole new role of people. Okay, so just to explain, the cameras, you only have one main cameraman, is it, or will each camera have a cameraman with it? Or a cameraman no, person? we have one um, non-automated camera and then we've an array of locked off cameras. And the camera person who's managing that moving camera will also set up the locked off cameras. So we have this combination of automated. We see it as giving superpowers to crew. We're using AI to allow people to do more, which, which for us is the point of AI, really. Okay, Don, thank you very much for your presentation today. Thanks, Elena. Okay. Let's move on. And Jürgen Osing is the commercial lead and co-founder of Pear Labs, a UCD spin-out which has developed a patented technology to make the invisible visible. Together with Professor Dominic Zarula, inventor and co-founder of Pear Labs, the team is now looking to raise seed investment to bring Pear Labs to market. Jürgen. Thank you. Despite significant advances in research and diagnostics, one in two of us will suffer from cancer at some stage in our lives. So why is that? Scientists we work with tell us that they know the subcellular particles, the molecules involved in the cancer disease, but they can't see them. They're too tiny. They don't know where they are and where they're moving to. Typically, scientists use optical microscopes to image a biological systems such as tissues and cells. But these microscopes lack the resolution to look deep enough into the subcellular world to reveal the detail that is necessary to understand the cancer disease. There's, there have been significant advances uh, led by uh, microscope suppliers such as Zeiss, Olympus and Nikon in recent years to bring more advanced systems to market. However, they all suffer from the same dilemma. They cannot achieve nanoscale resolution of the molecular events in real time they cannot give the scientists the information they're looking for. Perlabs has, uh, has developed a patented technology to overcome this dilemma. Perlabs has developed a, a, a nanochip that contains an array of uh, plasmonic emitters, which are the so-called light source to eliminate air samples. Perlabs not only generates still shots or snapshots, we generate movies of the subcellular world of the molecular events evolved in the disease. We can give the scientists the dynamic images and data to make advances towards the treatment of diseases. Pear Labs originates from the uh, physics research group of Professor Dominic Zerula, who has received the SFI Future Innovator Award, Award in 2020. I've joined Pear Labs, bringing commercial experience from spinning out a, a life science instrumentation business to the team. We are currently developing a prototype system which is going to be validated by leading cancer researchers in the UK and Ireland. We are aiming to become the super resolution imaging technology of choice and bring in a, our, our technology to market in an Intel Insight type business model, uh, which is currently already worth $2.7 billion. Further down our development roadmap, we see lots of opportunities in diagnostics products and applications such as uh, endoscopy or even pocket-sized consumer devices. We are now looking for seed funding 
to achieve our early milestones. Uh, I'd love to uh, partner with investors to join us on a journey to visualize how life works to make the invisible visible. Thank you. Thank you. Jürgen, can I just clarify, you're looking to effectively sell a part, is it, to microscopy manufacturers? That's correct, yes. It would be similar to what Intel uses. So they have a superior computer chip that they're supplying to the likes of Dell or Asus, but it's really a, a value-added part that enables a lot of... Uh, a lot of power, give powers the computer world. So it would be pair labs inside? It would be pair labs inside in the, in the optical microscopy world, yes. Okay, so how many potential manufacturers are there to sell to? Or would you consider maybe an exclusive an arrangement with some manufacturer who would then have the advantage over everybody else? Well, that's a commercial decision. There are, there are, there are four or five very large uh, companies, some of them I mentioned, and then there's a, probably another 10 or 20 in the mid-range. Uh, so we'll be looking to, to partner and talk to, uh, to probably the mid-tier, but ultimately we can see that we're moving to the top tier and supply uh, a large part of this market. You have a patent at present. How important is that to you? It's hugely important. Uh, I mean, patented technology uh, allows co other companies to differentiate their offerings, and it allows us, obviously, to protect our technology from any, anyone imitating it. Do you have many competitors in this particular field? Uh, some of, as I said, the, the, the larger incumbents have advanced technologies which they've brought to market, but they are, they are very complex and very expensive. There are some efforts from, that we see coming from other areas that are moving into this space out of the photonic chip sector, uh, which we are also addressing. Do the manufacturers not do this for themselves, or is it something that they are willing to get components in from outside parties? Uh, they, could be a bit of both. Uh, they have some, some manufacturers are very acquisitive. There's a company called Bruker who has moved from the analytical instrumentation space into the imaging space, and they've acquired a number of companies and technologies in the recent years to get a foothold. Jorgen, thank you very much for being thank with you. us and best wishes for the future. Thank you. And so, Miriam Savage is CEO and co-founder of Elevre Medical, a medical device company founded to bring innovation to the neglected area of breathlessness management. Currently housed in NUIG Galway and supported by a commercialization fund, the team will be spinning out in early 2020. Miriam, your three minutes start now. Breathlessness has been at the forefront of everyone's mind since March 2020. But did you know that for hundreds of, hundreds of millions of people, living with disabling breathlessness was already a reality? Breathlessness is a huge problem in many diseases particularly for the 250 million people living with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, where over half experience disabling levels of breathlessness every day. Daily activities that most of us take for granted become very difficult. Going to the shop, walking upstairs, getting dressed. Patients themselves describe it as a nightmare, and the fear of not being able to catch the next breath devastates quality of life. As the core symptom, Breathlessness also contributes significantly to COPD healthcare spend, which is estimated at a staggering $49 billion annually in the US alone. More severe breathlessness doubles COPD healthcare costs. With such a high number of people affected, despite optimized treatment plans, it's clear that current treatment options are lacking. This is largely due to impracticality for use or unwanted side effects. There is a significant need and, mark and market opportunity for safe, practical and effective breathlessness therapies. So to deliver innovation in the space, Elevery Medical has created ResWave, a first of its kind wearable technology that provides relief when patients need it most during daily activities. It delivers localized neuromuscular stimulation to target the neural pathways in the chest wall and to decrease the sensation of breathlessness directly. This class two medical device can be worn discreetly under clothing, with no, effect to the, with no disruption to the user, thanks to our patent pending technology. There are no other devices on the market that provide this offering, and ResWave has a strong case to obtain a breakthrough designation by the FDA, which would allow an accelerated pathway to regulatory clearance and reimbursement in the US. The total addressable market is 10.7 billion euro in the, Euro in the US and Europe, and there are several key players in the COPD space that provide exit potential. I'm an electronic engineer with over 10 years experience in medical device development and project management. My co-founder and our clinical lead, Dr. Dylan Crean, is a medical doctor 
with a passion for translating medical technology. And we've been supported by a team of top class advisors along the way. We have just completed a, a human factors evaluation of our prototype with COPD patients. And we're excited to be spinning out from NUIG and conducting our first on human clinical study in March. We intend to raise three million in, in funding next year to achieve key value add milestones and complete a larger pivotal clinical trial. Elevery Medical's novel Elevery Medical's novel solution delivers a new form of breathlessness therapy discreetly and comfortably and has the potential to help millions. We hope you'll join us on our mission to bring innovation to breathlessness management. Thank you. Miriam, thank you for that presentation. As somebody who uses an inhaler daily and also has to have a rescue inhaler res ready for exercise, explain to me a little bit more about neuromuscular stimulation. I mean, what exactly is it? Yeah, um, so it's... it's Breathlessness is a really interesting physiology, actually. So there's multiple things, multiple sensors in your body that feed into how breathless you actually feel. Um, and right now, the likes of inhalers, they all target the airways, open up the airways. But there is another mechanism whereby you have sensors in your chest wall that feed back signal to your brain to, to alter your breath, alter your or breathing, and you perceive that as breathlessness. So what we're doing is we're trying to, to target those pathways and dampen down the sensation. Tell us a little bit more about the machine. I mean, how big is it? How do you wear it? Um, yeah, so we just actually came through our first um, human factors evaluation. It's a vest type garment. It's very lightweight. Um, it can be worn under clothing. Um, and we got really good positive results from the, from the human factors evaluation where, you know, patients saying, I could wear this all day, you know, and it, it wouldn't be of any disruption to their lives. So we're very excited about that. Yeah, is it something that you would see people wearing during exercise or literally on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, it's... Um, the way we see it being used is that when somebody expects that they're about to do something that will make them breathless, they would wear it for a set amount of time. So it's not necessarily something you'd wear sitting on the couch, but yeah, as you're doing exercises or for these people, it's even just walking upstairs or going to the shop. It would allow them to, to do this and keep going longer without, without stopping due to breathlessness. Would it run off a battery or would it be rechargeable? Yeah, it would be rechargeable off a battery, absolutely. And how long would the battery last for? Uh, we're, we're currently trying to work out some of that, some of that stuff, how long it needs to last for, but absolutely you're looking at a few hours at least. And then what sort of price range would you think it would come at? Also looking at pricing at the moment. Um, it's an unusual one because it's a novel therapy. So we're trying to figure out how long exactly in terms of um, the value that we're adding with the thing, but we're, we're looking at competitors in the space. We're looking at about 750 um, euro at the moment. Okay, Miriam, thank you very much for your presentation. And a thank you to all of our 12 promoters here today. I think they've been absolutely top-class presentations, utterly fascinating ideas and products to be brought forward, which, as we were talking a little bit earlier about, will do enormous good as well, as well as providing financial opportunities for investors. You have, of course, an opportunity to vote on all of this. The poll is still open via Slido. Uh, you can still continue voting over the next 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so please do. You won't be able to, as we say, vote if you're on the EI website watching this. It's if you've logged in and you have Slido, the top right-hand corner, you will be able to vote for which of those 12 fantastic presentations is your one that you want to support. So we have a, in the meantime, we're going to have our judges are going to make their decision as to who is the one to watch. And we have a very special guest to introduce to you. So while we bring her to stage, I'd like you to have a look at this video. And tonight we want to celebrate that for the first time in the 92 history of the Academy Awards, a female conductor will be leading the orchestra for this performance. Finally. So here is Maestra Emir Noon to conduct this year's nominated Best Original Scores.
<laughs> Sigourney Weaver get it right? Was I going to get it wrong? I was going to call you Eimear. Well, uh, I, I uh, had a word to my mother about it and she said, no, I can't change my name to what Sigourney wants to call me. So it's Eimear. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eimear, thank you very much for joining us today. That must have been such a thrill, was it, to get the opportunity, as was said, she forgot to mention years, but the first in 92 years of the Academy Awards, the Oscars, the first woman to be conducting the orchestra. How big a thrill was that for you? It was an amazing experience. I mean, I knew that I was inhabiting a moment, and I knew that that moment had come on the shoulders of so many people. So that's what I took really seriously about it was, I imagined myself as a, as a little kid watching this and what I would want to see as a young musician and as a, as a young Irish woman, what I would want to see on the screen. And I thought this moment deserves to be respected by me and inhabited and relished. And I wanted to be present in that moment. And I didn't want to let the Irish girls down, so. <laughs> and was it what you wished for and hoped for? It was, it, it, it was absolutely, an amazing experience. I mean, creatively, musically, I knew most of the orchestra. I'd worked with them my, my whole career. Um, I love a theatre. I love the orchestra pit. It's home, you know, it's a different type, type of weird home. But it, it just, I enjoyed it so much. And, and the thing that I got out of it, I worked so hard on being mentally present and mentally owning the moment. And I feel that that's what I came out of it with. That was the gift that I got out of it. Uh, but it, it took a lot of work to get there, uh, career-wise, mentally, technically, musically, everything. And I want to get your entrepreneurship in a little while, but I want to stay for a moment about this whole thing of being a conductor, because what is it about being a conductor? I mean, it looks flamboyant in many cases of the people waving the baton around. I mean, what actually does a conductor do? Because to many of us ignorant people, we might think, well, don't the various musicians have the sheet music in front of them? Aren't they just following that? What impact does the conductor have on them? Well, it's, it's nonverbal communication at its you know, ultimate pushed as far as it can go. And it, it almost comes to a point where, you know, I use my, my, my physicality to communicate with the orchestra. Of course, I can't make any sound. If I make a sound, then it, then it gets in the way of the music. So I am using all of the nonverbal tricks that I can, I can have. It's been interesting actually conducting with a mask on this, this period during the, the, uh, the pandemic, because I feel like I've lost part of my nonverbal ability to communicate. Why, would you have been using your mouth always to mouth to people what they're supposed to do? No, but it's the full expression. I mean, uh, Botox is the enemy of the conductor. <laughs> you know, you just, that's not in, in, in my future, you know. Uh, we, we use every little, tiny little tick that you're giving off, the ultimate in, in uh, body language. It's like dance, only the music is reacting to you instead of you reacting to the music. It's, but there's a whole lot of nonverbal things going on. The eye contact is... is but is so what sort of messages are you trying to give to the members of your orchestra? Um, oh, oh, not that. <laughs> That's one of my favourite ones. Um, but there's the, the nonverbal is saying, you know, basic things. Tempo, uh, but also you're creating an energy. You're creating an atmosphere that you want to bring all of these people. Every single person in front of me in the orchestra has postgraduate degrees in music. Everybody has an opinion about how it should be played. But my job is to bring everybody together in one direction to create something that's bigger than, than any one of us. And it's, it's the ultimate in, imagine managing your, your team but not being allowed to speak any words to them to get them to move in one direction on, on a project. Of course, you have in music, maybe more contemporary music, you have cover versions of the originals that people come to love. Is a composer in some respects in an orchestra doing a cover version of the original vision of the composer putting their own mark in it? I have never heard anyone put, <laughs> put it like that before. Man. Is it that bad an analogy? A cover it? version. It's great, actually, because um, it depends on the type of music. Because when, when you're talking about classic repertoire, we have... Uh, we, we have certain traditions, and without getting too technically musical about it, um, nowadays we put as much as we can into a score. But there's certain things that you cannot write down in music. There's certain things you can't write down. I'll give you an example. Uh, 
R&B music, we talk about the groove. In jazz, we talk about the groove. You cannot notate groove. You can notate the bones around which you groove, but you can't actually notate that human feel, or as we call it, when everything's going right and everybody's in the same zone, being in the pocket. You can't notate any of that. That comes from human beings being together and creating together. Um, but for cover versions in, in terms of the classic repertoire, uh, the composers notate and put down as much as they can the basics. And then it's our jo job to research what would have been going around, on around that composer in that time. Performance practices of the day that we don't use anymore. If we want to be really authentic to the time period, we'll go back and use those. So many things, what was going through the composer's mind? What were they, were they in their life? What was going on around them? We use every piece of information we can to be as authentic with our interpretation as possible. And then for the Oscars, what music did you actually conduct? Because was it old movie scores or was it more recent songs that were nominated? Because again, it comes down to what interpretation do you put on those? Oh, for me, it was the five nominees and I couldn't have been happier. They were all in the audience. And these were the pieces that they had just written. Uh, I think this was the first live performance outside of the recording studio for the score that any of them had gotten. It, because it of was, COVID? Uh, no, because they're so new. Right. Um, you know, what, what tends to happen with film music is uh, at the very end of the film, once it has been edited, the composer writes the score. When you're watching the movie trailer, for a film. The score hasn't been written for the actual film yet. So that's how close to the end it is. Um, so these were the films that were nominated that mm. year. And if a score becomes hugely popular, it may be performed on the concert stage, but there is a, a time period between the actual movie coming out and that happening. And it's based on fan reaction and so on. So this was the first actual live performance of these five pieces that I know of. And that was such an honor. Uh, and for me, these were my heroes. And to perform their music for them was, was beyond. I couldn't let myself think about it until afterwards, that kind of way. You mentioned the nonverbal communication that you're doing with your orchestra. But what about as well the desire that perhaps maybe the audience has to see a performance from the conductor? Do you feel that there's a need for a conductor to be visible and showing their uh, movement just to actually get part of the audience engaged as well? Well, that's part of what I do because I didn't come from a, a classical music family. I didn't come from a family of professional musicians. So it was important for me for your general concert goer or someone who's never been to see an orchestra, for them to get a hint at what I'm actually doing and what I'm communicating and why I'm doing it and seeing the result of what my action is. And no matter what we do, if you're going to a concert, it's theater. You're watching people, you're watching the movements, you're watching the blood, sweat and tears happen before you. And it was important to me to be able to, sh to bring the audience into my little secret world in a visual way. And um, Every conductor chooses their own style and it's how you represent yourself and your music in a unique way. We were hearing earlier that there's only 3% of venture capitalists are women. How does the conducting business go for women? Because perhaps we have this image over the years of sort of long grey haired old men doing it a lot of the time. Well, it's so new that we don't even have any data. So that's where we are. And it's definitely less, I'd say less than 1%. So how did you get into it? Because you're also a composer and is that, and that's, I suppose, the main thing that we know you for and we're going to talk about at length in a moment. But how did you get into conducting as well? What was the drive and how difficult was it as a woman to get into doing that? Well, I have a very uh, visceral memory of walking past the TV. I was about seven years of age and seeing the guy with the big white curly hair and the tails in Vienna on a concert stage and I was blown away by what I saw. I just couldn't believe it and I went, okay, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> you know, it was as simple as that. I was about seven and it was, it was almost like everything after that was going towards that moment. Yeah, but the innocence and naivety of a seven-year-old, did that not wear off along the way and start thinking, well, actually, this is going to be a bit too hard for me to do? Oh, I am still that naive seven-year-old, absolutely. 
um, I, I remember um, writing my, my first week in career guidance, first week in high school, uh, in, in secondary school, and um, Sister Mercedes, are, are the nun who was our career guidance teacher. And of course, nuns have multiple careers. Uh, we had to write, you know, what I want to do when I grow up kind of thing. And my first line was, I will conduct the orchestra at La Scala. <laughs> Now that hasn't happened yet, but we're, we're you know, we, we still have to... And what reaction go. did you get to that from her? Um, I got, you know, uh, you're good at science, maybe the medical side, thanks to all of our brilliant med tech people today. I, they're my rock stars, they're amazing. Um, but what I did is, as soon as, as much as I loved science, as soon as I got to junior search, I dropped my science subject so everyone would leave me alone and let me do my music. And that's often an option. Uh, with musicians. Uh, we did a survey in my class in Trinity and uh, we were asked, what would your other career be? Uh, there were only two answers. One was mathematics and the other was medicine uh, out of that class anyway. So it's, it's quite common. And I remember this, the college orchestra, we had a lot of medical students playing in the orchestra as well. But when, you know, for me, instinct has been a huge driver in my career instinct and visualization and seeing myself doing something and living it emotionally. I mean, I've read books on visualization and realized I used to do that as a kid. I just thought of it as using my imagination, but it was the fact of seeing it as real and experiencing it as real in my imagination and feeling how it would be to be on that stage doing that. And, you know, putting on recordings and, and jumping around the room like an Egypt, you know, trying it out, see how it would feel and, and feeling the music so deeply and, and getting the goosebumps and wanting to figure out why is this making me feel this way? You mentioned mathematics and medicine as other things that mus music students in Trinity might have gone for if they weren't doing music. But you did something very interesting in Trinity, which I suppose really showed your entrepreneurial bearing as well in that you set up an orchestra. Now, why did you do that? And then what did you learn about business from the following five years with that orchestra? Oh my goodness. So it, it's funny, I was coming up on the train today and uh, I was writing an article on this very thing. And it's a strange, it, it, I think it has to be because I was coming here that I was thinking of it. But one of the things about conducting is you have to fail all the time in front of other musicians before you can get to a place where you're any good at it. What do you mean and by that? Explain that. You can't practice without other musicians. You can learn technique, but there's the, this is you're, you're practicing technique to nothing. You practice in silence. You practice with the score, you're reading it, it's in your head, and you're silence. So you're not understanding, you're not getting any feedback from your action until you're standing there failing because you don't know what you're doing when you begin in front of your colleagues. And that took tenacity and that took, uh, and that's something I'm passionate about, is, is helping people to feel safe in failing because as a conductor, you have to do that over and over and over and over in order to prove, in order to practice, you need 80 other people. So I wasn't waiting for someone to jump out of my closet and say, you're really talented here, have an orchestra, because that is never going to happen. So uh, a classmate of mine, Gillian Saunders, a cellist, and I, we were both very passionate about film scores and how they made us feel and the emotional aspect of, of film scores. In classic music, we have a term that is program music, and it's using music to paint a picture or solicit an emotion from the listener. And that today is alive in film music and video game music in particular. Concert music, yes, also. However, we use it specifically in, in, in um, collaborative music with other media to solicit emotion from the audience, to foreshadow something that's about to happen in the action, to plant the audience in this Im imaginative world that might have nothing to do with the real world. And this was fascinating to both of us. So we decided we wanted to put on a concert of film scores that we hadn't seen in Ireland yet and classic repertoire that was used in film because neither of us came from music families. And we wanted to share some of our favorite 
classic music in a way that made sense to absolutely everybody. And what we did was we set up the orchestra, we got all of our friends from, uh, from the College of Music, from Trinity, from UCD, from all the music departments, a lot of Irish youth orchestra people at the time, everybody together. We went and I called up the music publishers, I called up composers in LA. I was, we, I was 19 when we started. Um, our debut concert. So asking for permission to actually use the music, negotiate yes. payments? Yes, we had to negotiate um, rental of scores. I made friends with a librarian uh, for the RT orchestras who, who helped me find out who was who. And it was a cajole, call, convince. We didn't know what we were doing. We were, you know, we were figuring it out as we went along. You also had to get venues and you had to sell tickets yes. to cover your costs. So we booked the National Concert Hall. <laughs> the article I was writing this morning was, was for the National Concert Hall. We booked the National Concert Hall. So hang on, how much chutzpah is involved in a 19-year-old and her friend who are musical students going and saying, can we book the National Concert Hall, please, because we're putting together an orchestra that's oh. going to play film scores there. I'll never forget that phone call. I'll never forget. I think I did a little bit of the <coughs> deepening your voice to make you a little more credible thing on the phone. I remember them saying, you must sell a thousand tickets or we'll never have you back. Now, I say that to the concert hall people that I know now and they laugh because, you know, this is a different regime, but it, it was a thousand tickets. We thought, oh my God, here we were, the, you know, raggle taggle gypsies of orchestral music. We were literally doing takedowns of parts and writing, handwriting parts and photocopying them. And I was putting out chairs and doing everything. We had a budget for marketing this concert of 250 euro. That was our budget. And we resented having to spend it on anything outside of the music. So uh, Colin Connolly uh, from RTE came to our rescue and he did a piece on the lawns in Trinity while we were rehearsing in, you know, the room Regent Hall, just above Front Square, just above the Front Arch. That's where we were rehearsing. We were rehearsing the music from Batman, uh, Danny Elfman's score to Batman. It was reverberating all around Front Square. And there he is lying on the grass with the microphone deep in the heart of Trinity College, you know, ba -da -da -dee -da -da. and he sold out the house for us. People were fascinated. This is, what are these two mad students doing? I was 21. And we had to sell out the house because the only way we were going to pay for the concert was to sell out the house. Every single ticket had to be sold. And we did. And it was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I remember that, uh, I remember being so tired that we got a standing ovation at the end of the concert. It was one of those, you know, movie moments. And a lot of the movie industry showed up. Uh, we had John Borman agreed to be an honorary patron, Noel Pearson, composer Elmer Bernstein was in Dublin, popped into Dublin, and uh, we convinced him to be a patron uh, before he passed away. And we were so cheeky, you know, it was chutzpah, you know, on steroids, you know. And it's funny, I was thinking about this earlier on today. People say to me, you know, when you were a student, do you ever think you'd make it to the Oscars? And if you were to say to that student conducting John Williams at the concert hall, you know, and this is going to sound really strange. If you're going to say to that student, one day you will conduct John Williams for John Williams sitting in the audience at the Academy Awards, that student would have said, well, yeah, that's the logical conclusion to where we are right now. You had that much ambition and that much confidence? It wasn't confidence. It wasn't confidence at all. It was definitely naivete. Um, it was, in my mind, it was logic. If you put in the work, if you go in this direction with this. And it was all based on the music. It wasn't ambition towards career. It wasn't ambition about... I'm going to drive a big fast car and have a big house and show the world I've arrived. It was nothing to do with that. It was about my, myself and my friend, Jill, we put on these scores and we would just go, imagine playing this. Imagine being in the middle of this. Imagine putting this, imagine so-and-so and so-and-so and -so in the audience listening to this. They're gonna love it, you know? It was totally driven by that. And for me, the, the logical conclusion for that, the biggest hit of that, 
would be to, pe to perform that music for those composers. That would be the logical end to that. And it's not hubris, it's, it's total naivete. I had no idea how hard it would be to get there, absolutely none. You did it for five years with that orchestra in Dublin, then you decided to go to Los Angeles. What sent you to Los Angeles? I got a job. I was hired uh, thanks to brilliant, the brilliant, brilliant organization we have in, here in Ireland called Screen Skills Ireland. It was Screen Training Ireland at the time. Alongside my degree, I did um, a film scoring program uh, that was run by Screen Skills Ireland. And one of the composers was a professional orchestrator that they brought over, hired me based on my work in the class, basically, hired me as his assistant. And I was brought over on a project basis initially to work as an orchestrator and, as, uh, and conduct the sessions. So what an orchestrator does is you take a composer who doesn't come from the orchestral world, it's one of the, one of the types of jobs we do, it's the main one, um, doesn't come from the orchestral world but is working on a project that requires them to uh, express themselves through the medium of the orchestra. So they'll come to, to an orchestrator with their main ideas, their, their harmonies, their melodies, their rhythms, their counterpoint, and our job is to interpret that for the orchestra and make it playable and, you know, this is the world I, 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 live, I live in. You know, my first job was playing in orchestra pits at 14. So that, that was my first job, and my first job as an orchestrator <laughs> happened to be on the very first World of Warcraft video game. Now you're going to have to explain to some people what World of Warcraft actually is. World, Wa World of Warcraft is what we call um, an MMO, a massive multiplayer online game. And it's an RPG also, a role playing game. And these games exist online where you have people from all over the world can form a guild or a team that goes on these quests together. And World of Warcraft it has its own sort of mythology and its own characters, and it's very, very deep. Uh, when it had its 10th anniversary uh, five or six years ago, it had had over 100 million individual players in 10 years. Um, it is a huge, we had no idea at the time how, how huge it would be. And the exciting thing for me is that's 100 million people listening to orchestral music all over the world. And being, being excited about orchestral music, um, I've, I've toured the world performing some of the music that we recorded back then. So it's well, I'll get back to that and say, but it actually just strikes me, is this the way to perhaps save orchestral music for generations to come? In that, you know, classical music is not as popular as it once was for people going to performances. But I'm thinking of things like bringing my own children to classical performances, Star Wars music, because that's what they wanted to see, and they probably hadn't been at anything else. That via movies and via games, that you can actually save the interest in classical music. Well, more young people listen to orchestral music through their game consoles today than have ever listened to, to orchestral music in the history of music. If you think of it back in Mozart's day, there was no recording. So today, the amount of orchestral music recorded every year for video games is enormous. I used to, I've recorded you know, hundreds of hours of orchestral music for video games at this point. And it's really interesting because it imprints. When you're living inside of a game score, when you're, when you're living with a game, people don't play it for two hours and then it's done like a film. They live with it for as long as it takes. And that could be weeks, it could be months, it could be, in the, in the case of World of Warcraft, it could be years. And what happens is this, the sonority of the orchestra imprints as this is no longer the music of our grandparents. I have literally shaken hands with tens, and this is interesting in the post-COVID times, but literally shaken hands with tens of thousands of video game music fans. And they always want to tell me what their favorite song is. It's always referred to as a song, whether they're singing or not. My favorite song is the music from Skyrim. My favorite song is the music from World of Warcraft, from Zelda, whatever. And I'll say to them, well then does that mean that your favorite band is the orchestra and the reaction is always I never thought of it that way but I guess so and that's really exciting to me because this is the musical sonority that I absolutely love and I 
love deeply my classic music. I love my Brahms, I love my Bruckner, I love my Mendelssohn. And it's exciting for me to share those things with kids that are now predisposed to being okay with the, the sonority, the color, the sound of the orchestra through their video games. So tell us about writing for video games because this is where you've developed a sizable business for yourself, yes. uh, that you are one of the world leaders in this particular field. So what is it that you actually are looking to do and how do you do it? Well, it depends. It depends on who you're working with. It depends on what type of video game. If it's a children's game or if it's exactly. a young adult or an adult game. It depends on the type of where is the game going to live? Is it, uh, is it VR? Is it uh, a console game? Is it an online game? What is it as a mobile game? And for me, it's, it's really interesting because I really deal in uh, expressive, let's, let's call it expressive orchestral music. Um, which means I write for film, I write for TV, I write for video games. And it, it's, a, it's an interesting collaborative process because you are working with visuals and that's great from a creative perspective because I have a starting point that's inspirational that I can, I can look at. Sometimes when you're dealing with animation and animatics, it could be just stick men uh, voiced by one of the animators who may or may not be a good actor, you know, and you're trying to conceive of this giant orchestral epic sound. And sometimes it's fully rendered um, anim animation. Um, but it's always about uh, how to express and how to bring in the audience. And, and what point of view are you taking as the composer? Are you taking the point of view of the player and what they're doing, and what they're seeing and where they are and what environment they're in? Are you taking the point of view an um, of an omniscient being who's standing back and watching the entire thing unfold? And in film, we can play around with that. We can create uh, what we call foreshadowing. You have your characters driving a car, the sun's shining, the birds are singing, he's happy. You're, you're, you can score his happiness, that's his point of view. Or you can score from the perspective of an, um, of an omniscient being who knows that he's coming home to really bad news and you can foreshadow what's about to happen. So it's really interesting because there's a lot of psychology involved. But in terms of, in terms of business... So um, just before you get to the business of it, I mean, do the directors of the movies and the games and the producers, do they then sort of have strong opinions as to what you provide to them? Or do they actually really, if they're visual people and storytellers, do they get the musical element and the importance I'm of it? I'm smiling because I'm thinking of Donald Scannell backstage who will tell you that directors don't have any opinions ever on anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, of course, of course. And it's, um, you know, we, we have, uh, it, it depends on the director's background. And also it's uh, a sort of, you have to meet your, your sort of aesthetic soulmates yet you're coming from the same sort of aesthetic perspective. As in, one of the first things I'll do when I meet a director is ask, ask them for their top 10 favorite songs. Uh, because that gives me a sense of, oh, they were a grunger in their teen years, or, or they're a, they're a metalhead, or they're a jazzer, or they're whatever, they're, whatever they react to. Because music is such a personal thing. And it's such a visceral thing. I don't know why I love Metallica, I just do, you know? I don't know why I love Stravinsky, I just do. And it hits you on both, uh, it's first, I think it's visceral first and then it's intellectual. I go, oh, I love the way he did that or I love the way, but it's after I'm already captivated viscerally. So that's really important that you're dealing with somebody that you're on the same wavelength as or that you can get on their wavelength. But um, it's, it's, ne it's endlessly interesting, endlessly. So you were going to elaborate on the business development and how right. you've developed a business out of this. Well, we're a cottage industry in our house. Um, myself, my composer, or my, my composer, my, my husband. Husband comes first, composer comes <laughs> second, apparently. Um, my husband's also, uh, he's an Emmy-nominated composer. He's a music producer. We have been working on moving from being the hired guns, and th this is why I love big ideas, moving from being the hired guns to creating our own IPs and uh, creating our own projects that we can create in this, I, call, I think of Ireland as, as our, our laboratory, our wonderful safe environment that then we can project out onto the world yeah, What stage. sort of IPs or intellectual properties are you looking to develop? So, so creative IPs um, are, 
everything that you experience after, if you're working nine to five in your job, everything that happens, we're the ones that create everything that you experience uh, after your day's work, uh, outside of life events. So you get in the car, you turn on the radio, the music you hear, all of that is creative IP. The programs that you hear on the radio are creative IP. You go home, you open a book, that's a creative IP. Uh, you turn on your TV, you play a video game. The patterns on your wallpaper is a creative IP. All of these things. So it's all about owning what you create and creating something that can generate and, and move out and out and out. For instance, when we create a piece of music, that piece of music is traveling when we're working on the next thing. So that piece of music, say it's in a film, it's shown in cinemas, it's generating IP, which then comes back to Ireland. Then it changes format. It's now on the streamers after going to cinemas. That generates a different income for that IP. It comes back to wherever that IP, where that IP's home is, it's Ireland. So then it goes from there, from the streamers, the music, it becomes a con concerts and that tours all over the world. That comes back to Ireland. Then say the film generates merchandise. My music is in the toy that's, that's sold as part of the merch for, the, mu for the, the film. That's creating more revenue. That's creating more re revenue. But so long as you're in the services side of things, you're creating that revenue for somebody else. Whereas our, our thing at the moment, our big idea is to go from constantly being the hard guns to, to creating the IP, creative IP. And one of the things that is my passion uh, in Ireland, because it just makes too much sense to me, is the video game industry, an industry that is worth digitally $100 billion a year. And when we add hardware, uh, 100 to 300 and upwards of $300 billion a year. And I think that was recognised in the recent budget as well that yes. Minister Pascal Donoghue was aware of the impact of the industry mm -hmm. here in Ireland. So you're now back to spending more time in Ireland, I believe. You have been living in Malibu, which I say many people would envy your opportunity to live in Malibu in Los Angeles for many years. But you now split your time between it and Galway. Yes, we, um, we came home to work on a magnificent Irish film uh, produced out of Galway, European co-production called Two by Two Overboard by Motion Films. Absolutely world-class work. And uh, in the middle of, literally in the middle of recording the score, uh, we were locked down on. And we decided to stay. We decided we feel safer here. Uh, we feel safe, safest in East Galway. So we decided to stay. And then because we stayed, we started looking around and going, what about this? What about that? There's amazing things happening in audiovisual sector in the West right now. Um, we're involved there in, in lots of different projects. So what happened was we decided we're going to split the year in two, but we're going to move our company from uh, the United States to Galway, and we're going to see we're going to we're going to feel that out. There's there's amazing things happening. The uh, the film tax credit is wonderful. It's 32 percent in Ireland, but in the West, we have an extra 5%. Um, now extending the tax credit to the video game industry is a first small step. That will facil facilitate more service work coming in, but the big, the, go the goose that lays the golden egg is the IP and generating new IP in Ireland. There's, there's a city in Japan called Kyoto, and Kyoto is a city where they've created endlessly. They understand the power of creative IP. I know because I've just spent my Christmas present money for my kids and bought the stuffed Pikachu from Kyoto and bought the, the Nintendo uh, Switch and bought the Nintendo wheelie thingy, I forgot what it's called, and bought the games because that's, that's all part of the Nintendo creative IP and that's one city in Japan. We could do that in Ireland. And are you investing in facilities here in Ireland as we, well? We are actually, we are. We're um, uh, building a dub stage. Uh, What's a dub stage? A dub stage is where we recreate uh, cinematic con conditions for sound so that we can mix our sound and our music as you will hear it in the cinema. And we're doing that in East Galway. Uh, we just hired 
a young composer as uh, uh, we just added to our staff a new assistant who's Irish and she's very, very talented and I'm excited about her work. Um, and I, I just, I look around, I, I've seen, you know, so much of what the power of the video game industry and I look at it and I go, it involves technology and support around technology. It involves writers, directors, developers, uh, uh, producers, composers, actors. This, these are places that we excel. And this is a massive, massive industry. Uh, yes, we have this tax break in the budget and we have this hub that's happening in Sligo, but those are wonderful first small steps and they're very exciting. We're coming to the conclusion here, but we started by talking about your performance at the Oscars, but clearly that was not an end point for you. That's only a journey on what you intend to be, or a destination on a very long journey. That was a fun moment. <laughs> yeah, and that's sort of in my head. That's, that's what it was, is a, a really, really fun moment. Um, but, you know, creatives, it, it, this is who we are. It's not what we do. We can't, we can't stop being who we are. So what are your ambitions though? Uh, oh gosh, I, I never think of ambitions. I just think of projects that I would really like to see happen. And everything for me is instinct, how I feel about an idea. And I think every sing single person that presented here today, I could see that in them. It was, they're passionate. It's, it's, that energy is the difference between something being an idea and actually being physically there in the palm of your hand. And, and that's, that's for me, I have the, the, um, the, the project driven is, is where I am. It's that same thing of sitting down with my friend Jill and listening to the music and imagining what it would be like to inhabit it. It's been tremendous having the opportunity to talk to you. Absolutely fascinating and insightful stuff. Thank you very much for being with us today for the big ideas. Can you stay there with us if you wouldn't mind because we're getting to the point of the proceedings where we are going to be announcing our winners. The voting is just about closing so you can get it done quickly via Slido if you want to fin get in quickly. But I'm going to ask EI Director Stephen Creener to join us now on the stage to announce the winners after which I will speak to two of today's winners. Welcome to you, Stephen, if we can get you to take your place at the podium there, please. Thank you very much, Matt. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stephen Greener. I'm the Executive Director in Enterprise Ireland with responsibility for the Industrial Life Sciences Division and the Innovation Research and Development Remits. I'm delighted to be here today to participate in this event and do some closing remarks. It has been an outstanding event and you can see now why we ha carry out this event every year. It gives a great example of the vitality and the robustness of the research commercialization activity in Ireland and how it contributes to the Irish economy. I thought the 12 presenters today were a role model of the spin-out activity in the country today. And it was really interesting in the way they presented in a very concise, passionate, and hugely empathetic approach to their client and customer needs, the actual apt aptitude of their products for the resolving of particular problems and challenges. It was also very interesting to see their approach to innovation. They adopted a multifactorial approach to innovation, in my opinion, which not just focused on the product they were developing, but also the process by which it would be enabled to deliver to the market and the customer and client experience of what they were trying to deliver. It was very interesting as well to hear Deirdre Glenn's conversation with Matt, covering a whole range of elements in relation to the research commercialization contribution to the Irish economy. It's really interesting to see that over 1,200 people have participated and over 200 companies developed over the last decade, and they carry out a, a spend of about 120 million in the economy every year. That together with the contribution they make to our HPSU um, strategy within Enterprise Ireland, occupying about 15 to 20 percent of that remit, is really key to why we focus so heavily on this research commercialization activity in Enterprise Ireland. As I looked at the factors and the figures associated with today's event, it was really interesting and encouraging to see some new and emerging trends. You might remember from last year, we focused very heavily on female founders, and it's nice to see that that particular participation has grown in the last 12 months. This year, seven of the 12 
presenters today were co-founders out of the remit um, who were part of the spin-out activity. It's also interesting to see the number of people with large amounts of commercialization experience joining these spin-out companies. And that's a key factor that we think will enable their long-term success. As per last year, life sciences were probably the bigger uh, player in most of the presentations today. Um, but we're beginning to see a bit of a diversification within that particular cohort. And it was nice to see female health being a key aspect being represented, which wasn't always the case in previous years. Also, artificial intelligence was a key aspect, and that's a nice new addition to previous uh, remits. As I looked at the 12 presentations today, I don't envy the choices that were had to be made by the adjudicating panel, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what decisions they made. But before we get to the awards portion, I'd just like to thank a few people. Firstly, Matt, to thank you yet again. You're the absolute exemplar of preparation and professionalism. It's a phrase I think I used last year, and I can't believe it's 12 months since we were here last, but I just thought it was really brilliantly done. So thank you very much on behalf of Enterprise Ireland. I'd also like to thank the Big Ideas team. They were involved in every aspect of today's event and the preparation beforehand, both in terms of the pitches and in terms of the preparation of the look back video. And they had to tolerate me doing a couple of dry runs on that last Thursday. So, um, but I really appreciate the, the, the preparation and the quality in which they delivered today's conference. Finally, I'd like to thank Emer. I mean, I thought that interview was superb. You've come up with a new tagline uh, for big ideas. I think it should be called, I'll do that, you know, and uh, just thought it represented the optimism, the capability, and the absolute self-confidence that's required. I know you called it naivety, but I don't think it was. I think there's an element of, of you know, I can do that, so why wouldn't I do that? And uh, I really thought that was a brilliant interview. So that's the short summary of what my observations on today's conference. Um, again, a great event. Uh, I think we had about 1,200 people sign on. Sorry, 2,700 people sign on. We had about 1,200 last year. So this event is really growing, and we had a large um, voting population for the viewer's choice as well. With that said, it's time to move over to the awards. So this is the nice bit of the, of the afternoon. Um, I get to award uh, two of the prizes. Obviously, there's the One to Watch Award, which is adjudicated by a selection of Enterprise Ireland directors who are watching the presentations today. And then there's the Viewer's Choice Award. And as I said, over 2,300 people voted in the Viewer's Choice Award. So that's a fantastic response. So without further ado, if I could, I'd like to call out the One to Watch Award, which is our principal award, and it's to Lynn Markey of Extremity, Extremity Medical. Congratulations. <laughs> Lynn, if you could just wait there for one moment, I'm going to call up, uh, I forgot to mention, I'm going to call up the Viewer's Choice Award as well, um, so, we can, so Matt can have a conversation with both of you together after the actual awarding. And the Viewer's Choice Award is Jorgen Osing from Per Labs. Congratulations. <laughs> so with that said, um, I'd like to hand over the awards and then maybe Matt, I think you want to have a conversation with both of today's winners. So congratulations. congratulations. Well done. Thanks congratulations. So Thank you. Congratulations. Thank well you done. very much. Great, congratulations. If I can move you perhaps over towards the podium and we get into a shot here together. So, well done, congratulations. Lynn, just remind us again, just very briefly, what it is you're actually doing and what you hope to be able to do. Absolutely, so yeah, at the Extremity Medical, we're developing a surgical device to treat bone and soft tissue infections. Um, and we're currently raising a seed round to get this into patients, to get to first in man studies. And hopefully this will be a great boost for you. I'm sure all the venture capitalists who've been watching will have been greatly interested by the presentation that you made. Absolutely, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, it, how much of a pressure is that? I mean, having a great idea, having a real love for it, and then wondering, will you get backed financially for it? That's it, it's always the risk. No matter how good the technology or how good the idea is, if there isn't finance behind it, you run out of runway, essentially. So um, it's really at a critical point for Extremity raising this fund to get to the next level. And then having to have a good business plan behind it as well. Absolutely. 
That's key to getting investment, really. Yeah, I mean, how, for people who are very much coming from a scientific or technology background, how difficult is it to actually to come up with these sort of the, the nuances that are required to develop something as a business? Yeah, I mean, I think the technology has to be sound to be able to address the issue, but uh, we've been very lucky. We're, we're supported by commercial advisors within Galway that have been hugely supportive to Extremity Medical. They've really helped us bring on our business plan um, and develop it to get an investment ready. Congratulations, too. We look forward to seeing how you go in the years to come. Best wishes, and we look forward particularly next year's video and see how you've gotten on. And congratulations to you on your victory as well in this. Thank you, Matt. Uh, tell us a little bit again. Just remind us of exactly what it is you're doing. Yeah, Pear Labs has uh, developed a super resolution microscopy imaging platform that is going to revolutionize how we can develop uh, or look at diseases like cancer, look at beyond the tissue and cell level, look into the molecular level to understand the disease and uh, hopefully come up with some effective treatments. You're the commercial lead as well on this That's project. Correct. So just tell us a little bit about your role in doing that. Yeah, uh, I've joined uh, Dominic Zerula, the professor uh, out of uh, UCD, who has invented the technology together with his team. So I've come up, uh, joined uh, Dominic uh, to help with the commercialization in the last six months to the EI business partner program. It's been a great experience so far. And what, what was it that made you pick this particular project to become involved in? It's, I actually come myself from a physics background, so, uh, and I had done life science instrumentation before with a spin out of Trinity College, which we got from early stages through commercialization to a successful exit. So being in that domain was very intriguing to me, and uh, the potential that this technology had, I could see it as, and uh, it was an easy choice. Do you think is it important for others to do as you've done there to get somebody in as a commercial lead perhaps at times? Uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> if I look back 20 years ago when I did my first spin out, uh, there was no business partner program and I came out as a postdoc and took, took the leap into the commercial world and had to learn things the hard way and probably made a good few mistakes that could have been avoided with the help of a commercial lead. So I think uh, thinking about it, it's probably beneficial to have some commercial experience behind that. So what are your ambitions now for this business? How quickly do you think will you be able to scale up? Well, we, we the, the challenge now is to develop our, our first prototype, a minimum viable product, to get, get the finance to do that and execute our business plan to bring it, bring it to, uh, to some other microscopy uh, suppliers as a, as, a, as a partner to, that will bring it to the market then. So that's the challenge. So funding, development of the, of the product or the prototype, and then uh, execute the commercial plan. Congratulations on your award and best wishes for the future to both Thanks of you. Much. And indeed, I think it is fair to say I've been involved with this for five years now at this stage and the presentations today were absolutely excellent. 12 really, really good products that I can imagine very much being investor ready and that there will be many people who have been watching today who will be in contact with our 12 finalists who in their own way are all winners and uh, will be making hopefully very good offers to provide finance to move on to the next phase of developments. I'd also like to thank Emer for what was for me, absolutely a fascinating interview to conduct. I mean, she has been an absolute role model in her field and is very much inspiring as to what people can do based out of Ireland. So thank you to her as well for being with us here today. And to everybody involved in Enterprise Ireland for all the work that goes into assembling what is such a really excellent production. And I'm delighted to be the one who's just here at the end, uh, helping to put it all together at the very end. So until next year from Big Ideas, we look forward to seeing all of you again next year. Thank you very much for being with us.